Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this session. In this session, we are going to talk about one factor experiments in which you only have a single factor, but it can take different levels. So, typically, this factor is a categorical variable that can take different levels. And we are interested in seeing how do the different levels differ. Using the terminology of design of experiments, there are different treatments and we want to see how do the treatments differ. Is the population mean for all of the treatments the same or, if, or are they different? So if they are different, then we are typically interested in knowing which of the treatment is better than the others. So this session is going to focus on this important question. In the context of network performance evaluation studies, we are often interested in seeing what is the best possible option of doing something. So is the current protocol better or is it better if you modify it? It may also be that you have multiple possible candidate modifications and we want to compare the, the current way of doing things and the new protocols. And if the new protocols give, give you better values, then we would be uh, interested in moving over. But before that, we have to establish if that is really the case. More precisely, we do not want to make conclusions on the basis of random chance occurrences only. We want to establish with some certainty that if we are saying that method A is better than method B, then it is due to some real effect and not only to due to chance occurrence. So with this uh, context in mind and uh, the uh, topic of today's session being clarified, I can talk now about the things we are going to cover in this session. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how do we compare multiple treatments, where multiple treatments may be two treatment or more than that. We'd be seeing that there are different techniques. For two treatments, we have already studied a method which works for two treatments only. We will also see that if we are going to increase to more than two treatments, we need a new technique. And that technique is known as the analysis of variance technique, often shortened to ANOVA technique. And we're going to discuss that in today's session initially through an example and then through a model description of the ANOVA. So let us start by talking about ways of doing multiple treatment comparisons. The most basic setting in this regard would be to compare two treatments. And while I have not used the word of t-test before, we have indeed talked of confidence interval, which basically do the same thing. In fact, you would see that in your textbook, uh, the idea is that you can do everything you can do with hypothesis testing with the confidence intervals. And in fact, that is the case. You can do the same thing through confidence intervals. But for today, I'm going to focus on hypothesis testing. And we are interested in comparing the population means of different treatments. So the initial work in this regard especially in the context which is most applicable to real-world environments, was done by one William Gossett, who is also known by his pseudonym, Student. So this was in the year 1908, and uh, Gossett was an employee of Guinea's brewery, and he was interested in the problem of estimating about the population mean Given that you have very small samples, before him, most of the statisticians had access to voluminous data, a lot of data. And so they did not really concern themselves with the question of inferring from small samples. But here was uh, the first uh, attempt at tackling this question, and he proposed uh, the T distribution, which we've also talked about in the earlier sessions, which is like the normal distribution, but a little different in that it is more spread out. It was seen that if you want to estimate parameters from 
uh, small samples, you cannot use the normal distribution, you have to use the T distribution. The T distribution is characterized by a degree of freedom parameter and if the degree of freedoms parameter is large enough, your T distribution is almost identical to the normal distribution. And this degree of freedom parameter is actually closely related to the sample size. So the year was 1908 and Gosset published his paper, The Probable Error of uh, Mean, in the journal Biometrica. And here he tackled the problem of inferring from small samples. And the general idea is that you want to compare two treatments and the null hypothesis is that both of them have the same population mean. And we are interested in establishing evidence for the alternative hypothesis that in fact the two uh, populations are different. The modified uh, method may be better in some sense to the original protocol or the original method and we are interested in observing and producing evidence of this. So how do we go about this? The basic idea is that even if the two samples are taken from the same population, agar dono samples ek hi population se hai, or alternatively they are from different populations, but the populations have the same mean. So even if that is the case, the samples would be different in some context. You would expect that because we're doing sampling. In fact, if we take one population from one sample, even then we don't expect that every sample would be identical to every other sample because of the sampling process. You have some random variation due to the process of sampling. Now the question is, we are now a little confused. If we observe some differences between two samples, is the difference due to random variation or is it due to some real difference in the population from which these samples are drawn? And this is at the heart of the question which Gosset actually addressed. And this is what we are interested in as well. When we are doing uh, analysis on the basis of samples, we want to first of all determine what is the random error and then compare the difference that we have observed and if the difference is small compared to the random error, we would say that in fact the two samples are coming from populations having the same mean, but this is because of the random error. In other words, the difference between the samples is explained on the basis of random variation. Now the question, important question is, when do we actually decide that now the variation is too large and it is untenable with the null hypothesis? The most probable case is that the null hypothesis is in fact true because the results that we have are very extreme considering the null hypothesis to be true. And we've seen this before when we talked of uh, hypothesis testing and uh, when we talk of confidence interval, this is done by the usage of the method of calculating critical values. So these critical values are values which define an interval. So assuming an alpha of uh, let's say 0 0.05, which is uh, the 5% cutoff, the threshold of the type 1 error, we would define a confidence interval in which most of the sample means would lie. And if you have a sample mean outside of that, you would say that the null hypothesis does not explain this because this thing is very rare. While there is still some chance of an error, we would still reject the null hypothesis because this chance of error is very low. We typically set it to something below 5%. Let me give you an example to show how we can use the t-test for comparing two samples. I will give you some historical perspective on Gosset as well. Because he was employed with uh, an industrial company, the company did not want him to publish articles using his name. So he actually used the name student and the paper in Biometrica was published with the name student 
and in fact the t test is also often called the student's t test it was in fact william gossett but because of this restriction we often do not know the real inventor of or the real creator of this method so let us now come to the example this example was earlier covered in lecture 9 when we talked of confidence intervals there we used the method of confidence interval but now i'm going to talk about the method of a paired t test the idea is that we want to compare two protocols one is the original protocol the de facto way of doing things and one is the modified protocol we want to see which one of these protocol is better so for that because uh, there is a direct relationship between the readings we call this a paired test because we are sending a message of different sizes but we compare the readings for the same size for both the protocols and because of this linkage we can have uh, the direct difference between this uh, these pair of um, experimental units so for that we calculate the differences and we can see that on the slide now you see that there are six measurements and you have six readings for the original protocol and six readings for the new protocol and these six readings are paired and so because of that we can also have six readings of differences so now we want to answer the question that is there a real difference between these two protocols it may be that the two protocols are not different and we have this difference just because of random variation so the question then is is this uh, difference due to some real effect or it can be explained on the basis of chance so for that we need to calculate a few things the first thing that we would be calculating is the standard deviation of the difference and then on the basis of that we can calculate the standard error the standard error comes out to be 1.69 and if i can reiterate the intuition of the standard error it is if you keep on taking repeated samples how much do you expect the sample means to differ this defines the random variation for us so typically if you keep on taking more and more samples you would expect that on average they differ by close to 1.69 which is the standard error in this case we have a difference of 1 so clearly we can make out that simply on the basis of chance we are going to have differences of the order of 1.69 so the difference that we have is currently even less than that so we already expect that our evidence is not strong enough to reject the null hypothesis but we would actually calculate the t statistic the t statistic is calculated according to the method shown on the slide and the score comes out to be minus 0.59 because we are calculating the difference as the original protocol minus the modified protocol so now we should calculate the critical t value the critical t value for the degrees of freedom which is 5 in this case because you have 6 readings the degrees of freedom of 5 would produce a critical value of 2.57 plus minus our t value is minus 0.59 which is less than minus 2.57 the magnitude 0.59 is less than 2.57 and because of that we will fail to reject the null hypothesis and we would say that the two treatments are equal because we cannot establish the case for the alternative hypothesis i hope i have conveyed the method of comparing two treatments in a way which you have understood well now we can go to the topic of comparing more than two treatments the first obvious question which we must ask ourselves is that can we not use the same method of the t test the thing is that t test is actually a comparison between two you know samples and if we use the same method for performing multiple tests so the the problem arises that we have the uh, we are inflating the value of alpha or the chances of making a type 1 error 
If you recall, a type 1 error is when you reject the null hypothesis, when in fact the, in fact the null hypothesis is true. We do not want to do that. But if you perform too many t-tests, you are in fact going to increase the chance of making this type 1 error. So, when we proceed to the case when we have more than two treatments, typically three, four or more than that, then we have to use another technique. And this technique was proposed by Ronald Fisher of, you know, the same uh, Ronald Fisher who created the field of design of experiments. He was a very influential statistician and he actually proposed this to, to, for his study of agricultural yields. So the idea is that um, ANOVA test is also a hypothesis test in which you have a null hypothesis and you have an alternative hypothesis. In this case, the null hypothesis is that the population means of all the treatments are identical. The alternative hypothesis for which we have to produce evidence is that at least one mean is different from the others. In other words, at least one population mean is different for, from the other population means. In other words, still one treatment is significantly different from the other treatments. So, we have said that we cannot use many t-tests for doing this. We need to do the ANOVA test. So, what is the ANOVA test? Let me give you initially the intuition of this. So, the general idea is that if you want to compare multiple groups, you can see multiple groups shown on the slide now. On the left hand side, you see that the groups have lesser amount of variation amongst themselves. In the other group, even inside a group, you have a lot of variation. So, the intuition is that we get an idea about random variation from the amount of variation that you have within a group. Okay, so on the basis of that, you take a ratio of the variation that you find between the groups and uh, you normalize it by dividing by the variance that you have inside a group. And this is the analysis of variance method. So, regardless of uh, the fact that the name says that this is analysis of variance, what we are really interested in seeing is that if the treatments have the same population mean or if they have, you know, different population mean, at least one treatment has a different population mean from the rest of the treatments. In fact, in an ANOVA test, we are assuming that the groups have constant variance and then we actually compare the variance between the groups to the variance that we have inside a group and on the basis of that we calculate a test statistic which is known as the F statistic named in the honor of Fisher. And this F statistic is treatment effect plus chance divided by chance. In other words, this is the between groups variance divided by within groups variance. And if the between groups variance is very large and we say that the different groups vary by a large amount which cannot be explained on the basis of random chance alone, you would have a high value of the F statistic and if it is higher than a certain threshold, we will reject the null hypothesis. So, in a way this is very similar to the t-test, but in the t-test we were comparing means. In this case, we are comparing uh, variances. We are uh, calculating a ratio and if the, that ratio is large enough, we reject the null hypothesis. So, let me now tell you about the F statistic and the F distribution. This is a way of determining if the treatment difference is actually significant or not. So, for that, I will show you the F distribution on the slide now. You would see that it is a distribution which is bounded on the left hand side by 0 because this is a ratio of variance 
it is always going to be more than zero, uh, we define a critical F value point. And that critical F value point is dictated by the number of degrees of freedom, both for the number of items within a group and also by the number of groups that you have. So now the F distribution has two degrees of freedom. Because this is a ratio, a ratio between, between groups variance and within groups variance, you also have two degrees of freedom. The first degree of freedom is called the numerator degree of freedom because the between groups various is in the numerator of the F statistic. The degree of freedom that is relevant here is calculated from the number of groups. It is in fact the number of groups minus 1. The denominator degree of freedom is calculated as n minus k where n is the sum of sample sizes of all groups and k is the number of groups. So if you have three groups and each one of them has uh, six items, then n would be 3 into 6, 18, and you divide the number of groups from this to get 15. So the denominator degree of freedom is calculated in this way. And if you have both these degrees of freedom, you can calculate the F critical value. And uh, now the logic remains the same. You have a test statistic and you have a critical value. If the test statistic has a value which is greater than the critical value, we can reject the null hypothesis. And if we reject the null hypothesis, what does it tell us? What is the alternative hypothesis? It is that at least one treatment is significantly different from the others. So it really does not tell us that which treatment is different. It simply tells us that at least one treatment is different. And we typically follow up an ANOVA test with follow-up t-test because then we have the guarantee from the ANOVA test that at least one treatment is different. We can then use t-test for doing pairwise testing. Okay, let us now do an example to build upon the concepts discussed to make it more concrete. So. This is a one factor, three level design, which means you have a single factor which can take three different values. So you have the original protocol and you have a modified protocol A and you have another modified protocol B. So this is just a single step above the difficulty level that we did in the earlier example. In that we had an original protocol and a modified protocol. In this case, we have an additional protocol, an additional modified protocol, making the number of treatments equal to three. So you have a single factor and three levels. And because of that, you cannot use the t-test method. We need to use the ANOVA method. So the first thing that we need to do is to incorporate the principle of randomization in the calculation of data itself you would recall that one of the basic fundamental principles of design of experiments proposed by Ronald Fisher was the usage of randomization to remove the effects or to minimize the effects of extraneous variables or the other uh, noise or nuisance variables. So for that, you actually conduct the different uh, experiments at, uh, in a randomized fashion. And you can see that here uh, on the slide now that the run has been randomized. And this randomization is not done in a haphazard way uh, which fits the intuition of the experimenter, but it is done by a validated method of randomization. We would be covering valid ways of doing randomization in a later part of this course. But for now, you should remember that this is not done on a whimsical basis. This is done through some good method of randomization. So this is an example in which we have completely randomized design. We have a single factor. We have three levels. And we are doing six replications because we have six measurements for each of the protocol, the original protocol, 
and the two modified protocols. When we have conducted these experiments, we can calculate the mean for each one of these protocols. The original protocol has a mean of 153.7, the modified protocol has a mean of 178.3 and the modified protocol B has a mean of 156.2. So if you had not studied this course or any similar course, you would say that okay we have evidence that the original protocol is actually better than the other protocols if our aim is minimizing this. But you should know better now that we cannot really conclude that on the basis of a very small sample. We need to do proper statistical testing of this to see if some statistically significant difference exists between these three treatments or if we can say that they actually are coming from the same population mean and this difference can be explained on the basis of random chance only. So now we are going to do that statistical experiment to calculate the significance of the difference. So for that we need to know how ANOVA works. So ANOVA works by partitioning the variance found into variance between the treatments and the variance within a group for a single treatment. So the first thing that we are going to study is the total sum of squares which is the difference between the observations and the mean value and you clearly see that on the graph on the bottom left side you can see three different protocols. The first protocol is the original protocol and it is having observations on either side of the grand mean which is the mean of all the three treatments and uh, you also have the other two protocols shown. So the general idea is that we calculate the square of deviations for each observation and we sum it up. The way of doing that is shown on the slide now and if we calculate that the total sum of square comes out to be 3531.61 and we also have a concept of degrees of freedom. So because there are three levels and uh, for each level you have six replications, the degrees of freedom are 17. I must point out here that the sum of square deviations is often called variation. This is because this is the numerator term of the variance. If you recall when we discussed sample variance, uh, the formula of sample variance has this uh, term in the uh, numerator and it is uh, normalized in a sense or we take an average of sorts by dividing by the degrees of freedom. So we would be seeing uh, a technique known as allocation of variation which actually uses the variation terms which is distinct from variance. Okay, let us now see the within group variation because up till now we have seen the total variation between each point and the grand mean. Now we can see the variation between a group because our aim is to break down the overall variation into variation within a group and between groups. So now we are discussing the within group variation. This is also known as the sum of square of errors because we are taking the deviation from individual observation to the mean of that treatment and that can be seen on the slide now. You see that every observation we take a difference from that from the mean of that treatment or that level and then on the basis of that we calculate the sum of square errors according to the formula shown on the slide. The sum of square errors comes out to be 1319.50 and it is always less than the total variation. Remember the total variation is the sum of the variation between groups and within groups. So after this we also talk of the degrees of freedom in this aspect of within group variation and this depends on the number of replications of a single level or the number of replications in a treatment because 
we have three groups and uh, each group has uh, six replications if we subtract one from six we multiply that by three we get a value of 15 so now an important point is that we can take the average of uh, this by dividing the sum of squared errors by the degree of freedom and this gives us something like uh, the variance that we were talking about earlier if you recall sample variance also normalizes the variation by the degrees of freedom so mse is the mean sum of square errors and it comes out to be 87.97 we use a similar method for calculating the between group variation to have a significant result the within group variation should be less and the between group variation should be more and on the basis of that we say that we have on average very small random variation and because our results have large variation we can reject the null hypothesis so with this thing in mind let's now see what happens when we talk of the treatment sum of squares also known as ssa in your textbook so this is calculated in which we take the difference between treatment mean and the grand mean and this is calculated according to the formula shown on the slide we see that the ssa value comes out to be 2212.11 and the degrees of freedom are 2 because we have three groups and the degrees of freedom is one less than that it is equal to 2 and we can also calculate from this the mean sum of square due to treatment and this comes out to be 1106.06 so now come we come back to the concept which i earlier alluded to of allocation of variation which means okay we have this variation um, how much of it is explained by the treatment and how much of it is explained by simple random error so we infer the random error from between the group variation and we infer the treatment effect from between groups variation so actually calculate the ratio of SSE and SST the sum of square of errors and the sum of square total variation and this ratio comes out to be 0.37 alternatively SSA over SST comes out to be 0.63 which is 63 percent so now we can say that the model or the treatment explains away 63 percent of the variation seen in the response while the remaining 37 percent can be explained on the basis of error so this is a good intuitive way of understanding the variation this is easy to explain to the management and to the stakeholders you must uh, very carefully note that this is allocation of variation remember variation as the numerator of the variance so this is not the allocation of variance calculating that is more hard than calculating this and we actually use this a lot in practice uh, we calculate SSA over SST and we say that this is the amount of variation which is explained by the treatments and this is not something totally new if you actually try to uh, connect the dots we have earlier talked of regression and in regression we also talked of least squares error criterion in which we also introduced SSE the sum of square errors which were the residuals between the observation and the regression line and we said that a good regression line is one which minimizes the SSE and we also said that if we uh, take an average of sorts of uh, SSE we divide it by the degrees of freedom we get what is known as the mean sum of square errors which is like the variance and if you take the root of this we get the root mean sum of square of errors which is like the standard deviation but we use these terms when we talk in the context of regression and ANOVA and we do not normally use standard deviation 
and uh, those terms. These terms are more specific to regression and ANOVA. We also talked of the quality of regression fitting, in which we said that a good regression model explains most of the variation in data. And uh, we calculated that as uh, SSR divided by SST. And we're doing exactly the same here when we use SSA divided by SST to describe how much of the variation is described by the treatment. So for the example that we are considering, the proportion of the variation that is explained by the treatment is 62.6% uh, because R square comes out to be 0.626. One important aside here is that this R square is the square of the Pearson correlation coefficient. So uh, it's good to tie things together. So you may want to go back and see how these things are related together. Okay, now having discussed allocation of variation, we said that, okay, this explains 63% uh, uh, of uh, the variation, the error explains 37%. The question now is, is this difference significant in a statistical sense? Can this be explained on the basis of chance? To do that, we actually need to calculate the F statistic that I talked of earlier in this session. The F statistic is calculated as the ratio of MSA and MSE, the mean square of sum due to treatment divided by the mean square of sum due to the error. And the ratio of that is calculated here in this example to be 12.57. Is this a high value? Is this a low value? How can we determine that? So we need to determine the critical F value. And to do that, we need to first of all determine the degrees of freedom for the numerator and for the denominator. So the degrees of freedom here are 2 and 15 respectively because you have two groups and the number of all the items subtracting the number of groups comes out to be 15. So you have an F distribution having degrees of freedom of 2 and 15 and you have an alpha value of 0.05. The critical value that we calculate on the basis of this is 3.68, which is a lot less than what we have. So our test statistic is more than the critical value. We can reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we have established the evidence that at least one treatment is statistically different from the other treatments. So furthermore, in such testing, we usually also calculate the p-value, which must be a familiar concept to you, but I will reiterate that. P-value is the probability of having a result as extreme as those observed, assuming that the null hypothesis was in fact true. In other words, you assume that the null hypothesis is true, there is no difference between the population mean. If that is the case, what is the chance that random variation alone has created this difference? In this case, this thing, this probability is 0 0.0006, which is very low. It is lower than alpha is equal to 0 0.05, and because of that, we can reject the null hypothesis. So let us now discuss at what we have accomplished. We have rejected the null hypothesis, but that does not tell us which treatment is better than the other one. So, bit of an anticlimax, right? So, to discover that, we can actually use some follow-up t-tests. So, we can do pairwise comparisons, and then on the basis of that, we can estimate which, uh, you know, treatment is different from the other. So, we have done this here. You can see both the table recording the measurements as well as the results on the basis of t-test. One important point here is because we are assuming constant variance for all the three treatments or the three protocols, the standard error for all three would be the same. So if you recall 
the way we calculated standard error, it was sigma over under root n. In this case, instead of sigma, we use the under root of the mean sum of square errors and we divide it by the number of items in a group. So, if we have different number of items in a group, then the standard error would change. But if we are assuming that the number of items in every group is the same, then you are going to have identical standard error. In this case, it is 3.83. On the basis of this, we can calculate the T statistic value and compare it to the critical value for the degrees of freedom that we have. And on the basis of that, we observe that treatment 1 versus 2 comparison and treatment 2 versus 3 comparison is significant because the p-value for those comparisons are less than 0 0.05. And this is how we establish how and which treatment is different from the other treatment. Okay, let us now talk about ANOVA models. How do we model the ANOVA relationship to explain the variation in data? So, what we can do is we can have two different models. The first one is called the means model and that explains or predicts the response variable on the basis of treatment means. So, if you observe here, i is an index into the number of treatments. So, you have a number of total treatments and i is just an index. j is the number of replications of some particular treatment. So, in a means model, the predicted observation is actually calculated from the treatment mean plus some error. There is another kind of a model known as an effects model in which you divide the treatment mean into two things. One is the grand mean which is the mean across all the three treatments and then you have a treatment factor. In this case it is represented as alpha i where i is the index into the a number of treatments that you have. So, using this now we can differentiate also on the basis of treatments and we can say that this treatment is uh, on average giving us a result this much above or below the mean. Our assumptions are that the populations are normally distributed, they have equal variances and observations are independent from each other. So, let me give you an example of this. You can see an example on your slide now which is from your textbook. So, you have three treatments here. You still have a single factor but they are at three different levels. We call them three different treatments R, V and Z and they are shown in this case in columns. So, R has five replicates. We can calculate now the treatment mean for each one of these treatments and we can also calculate the grand mean which is the mean for all the observations and we can then calculate alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3 which is how much of the effect is observation is explained by the treatment effect. So, we see that R is producing an effect of minus 13.3 below the mean, V is producing an effect of uh, minus 24.5 below the mean and Z is producing uh, an effect of 37.7 above the mean. We can also represent this in a matrix form in which we are simply doing cell wise addition. So, we represent this as y j of i. Please note that I have made uh, some difference in the notation to suit the example of the book. So, j in this case is the number of replication. It is an index into the number of replication and i is the treatment. So, you have the treatment effects in columns. So, uh, y j of i is equal to the grand mean which is explained as the first matrix after the equality sign and after that we have the treatment effects. We see that the treatment r has an effect of 13.3 uh, positive 
V has an effect of minus 24.5 and Z has an effect of 37.7. And then the last matrix is the error matrix. Because we have replicates, we can estimate the error as well. And SSE can be calculated from this matrix. And on the basis of this, we can actually also calculate how much of the variation is actually explained away by the treatments. So we calculate that. The calculation is shown on the bottom of the slide. You see that SSA divided by SST is 0 0.104, which tells us that the random error element is a lot. SSA is only explaining 10.4% of the variation. So we've talked of the ANOVA test specifically for the one-factor experiments. These are also known as the one-way ANOVA tests because you only have a single factor which may take different levels. But we have some assumptions. We have stated some already. We assume that the populations are normally distributed. We have assumed that the populations have constant variance. This is something known as homoscedacity, populations having same variance. So if some uh, populations have different variances, you would call that heteroscedastic. So there are, while there are some transformations and ways of addressing the violations of these assumptions, it is also you know, binding on us if we want to use ANOVA, we must see if our data is actually conforming to the assumptions that we are making. So the assumptions are that the observations and errors are independent, normally distributed, and have constant variance. And uh, also that the errors and effect of factors are additive. And we have assumed that in our model and we have an additive relationship. So how do we go about confirming if these assumptions are actually met by our real data? There are some numerical methods for doing this and there are some graphical methods of doing this. And we emphasize the usage of graphical methods because it gives us simply by eyeballing the data enough intuition if the assumptions are being met or not. So as an example, let's see two employments of graphical method in which in the first graph we are seeing if the residual are homoscedastic or not. One way of determining that is to see uh, by plotting the predicted response against the residual. And let me point out that residual is the difference between what you are predicting and what is actually happening. This is the residual. Error is subtly different from residual. Error is the observation that you have and how it is different from the real population parameter. So we, we are dealing with the residuals here. So when we plot the residuals against the predicted response, we should not be observing some trend there that you know, as the predicted response uh, grows, you have some trend maybe of increasing residuals or decreasing residuals. Residuals should be random around the mean value. So that is one way of determining and validating ANOVA assumption. Another way is to plot the residual and to see if it is normally distributed. We would expect the residuals to be normally distributed as well. So these are only some of the ways of determining visually if ANOVA assumptions are met. Uh, it is outside the scope of uh, this course and of this session to explain away all of the details in this regard. But the idea is that I want to highlight the importance of it. And then I would refer you to you know, relevant textbooks to find out more detail. There are also methods available for transforming your data if assumptions of, uh, let's say, constant variance is not met. But uh, apart from telling you that, I'm not going to get into more details of this. So let me now conclude this uh, lecture.
and I'm going to tell you of the salient points of this uh, session. So the first thing is that ANOVA analysis of variance method, which by the way is not limited to only one factor experiments, but is best explained in this context. ANOVA is an extremely important tool and it can be used to compare multiple levels of a categorical variable. And to highlight the importance of ANOVA, I'm going to read a quote by Douglas Montgomery, who is the author of Design and Analysis of Experiments, the most commonly used textbook in this area of design of experiments. And he says about ANOVA that this is probably the most useful technique in the field of statistical inference. Very high praise indeed from a leading authority in this field. So it's really important that we learn this uh, technique and apply wherever it is relevant. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.